Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. I joined a game of hide and seek on the dark web. I don't have much time, so I'm going to write this as quickly as I can. Yesterday, I was browsing the dark web to amuse myself, just seeing what sites I could find to see if I could uncover anything interesting. I'd been clicking through several mundane links that led to dead forums or private sites that were only interesting to a very small subset of people. I was about to give up and call it a night when I eventually stumbled upon a site that intrigued me. It was an innocuous link on a directory list I'd found. When I clicked on this particular link, the screen was filled with a flying American flag. Standing before it was a very tall man in a very fancy-looking black suit wearing an eagle mask. Plastered at the top of the screen were the words, All American Extreme Games. Underneath were what looked like several different videos. I was about to scroll down and click on one to explore further when the page loaded a small advert. It claimed that it was a site that hosted all manner of popular childhood games, but taken to an extreme level like a massive nostalgia kick that everyone secretly looks for. As I looked through the site, I found that there were several videos, all linked to some kind of game that I recognized from my childhood. Among others, there was Red Light, Green Light, Simon Says, and my personal favorite, Hide and Seek. From the thumbnails, they looked incredibly fun. There were videos of a Capture the Flag game, where the contestants were running through what looked like a gigantic industrial estate chasing down the flag bearers before tackling them to the ground and stealing the flag for themselves. A sense of excitement began to well up from within me. I remembered playing these kinds of games when I was a kid. It would be fun to have another go now that I was bigger. I eagerly clicked play on one of the hide-and-seek videos. I wanted to know how this whole thing worked. It looked so fun. The game consisted of a group of adults, split into hiders and hunters, from the video, it looked like they were playing a massive game of hide-and-seek all the way across the city. When a hunter found a hider, there was a chase, ending in either the hider getting away or the hunter catching them. I imagined what it must be like. It was my favorite game as a kid, but as an adult, it must be even better. I'd be much better at it now, too, I thought to myself. I'd pick much better hiding spots. Almost as if in response to my thoughts, a pop-up took the focus of my screen, pulling my attention back. It looked to be an advert. Think you've got what it takes to win, it said. Intrigued, I read through it. As I scanned the ad, my heart skipped a beat when I realized it was for the next hide-and-seek game that the site was organizing. It was recruiting players. The excitement I'd felt initially when I found the site was nearly doubled now, knowing that I might be able to join in. Reading through the details, it went on to explain that the participants of the game would be split into two teams, hunters and hiders. The hunters needed to capture the hiders and bring them to a specific location, where the hider would then be out and the hunter would earn one point. The hiders needed to evade capture for the duration of the game in order to win. It sounded simple enough. Starting tomorrow, the game would take place over the course of two weeks or until all of the hiders were caught. At the bottom, there was a section titled Grand Prize. My jaw dropped as I counted all of the zeros in that number. Not only would I be able to join in with what looked to be an incredibly fun version of my favorite childhood game, but I could also win enough money to set me up for the rest of my life. Even the runner-up prizes were nothing to be scoffed at. Without much hesitation, I thought I would try my luck. Worst case, I'd be out with nothing, best case, I'd be rich, but either way, I would enjoy myself. Giddily, I tapped the Apply Now button at the bottom of the pop-up. The button relocated me to another page of the site titled Rules and Terms. Oh great, I thought to myself, mountains of small print to read. It had dampened my excitement slightly, but much to my surprise, there were only five lines on the page. Rule 1. Hiders must be brought in alive and not incapacitated. Rule 2. Hiders must not kill or incapacitate hunters. Rule 3. No players are allowed to leave the city boundaries. This will be enforced by our agents. Rule 4. 
anyone who turns off their phone location immediately forfeits the game. We will be watching for any signs of cheating. Rule 5. Once you're in, you're in. No backing out until the game is complete. At the bottom of the page was a small section for me to add in my details and sign up. I was amazed. There were hardly any rules. I guess that's what makes it extreme, I thought. A slight sense of apprehension welled up in me. I began to question if maybe this was a scam. Then again, the videos on the site looked real. And if this was real and I missed my opportunity to join in, I would kick myself. Without giving myself time to question further, I quickly filled in my details and pressed apply. I know handing out your personal information on the dark web is generally a bad idea, but the excitement and the thought of that money quieted the voice in the back of my head, telling me it was a bad idea. The screen then changed to an image of the suited man wearing the eagle mask tipping his hat to me with the caption right on, you got this, we'll contact you when it's game time. It was done, hopefully. I'd signed up in time. The date on the advert had been tomorrow, so I was hoping I'd just beat the closing time. I watched hide-and-seek videos on the site for the rest of the night, trying to prepare myself for the game to see what strategies others had used before. I really hoped that I was on the hunter's team. I didn't mind the hiding aspect of hide-and-seek, but I much preferred the detective work involved with finding someone who was hidden. I'd always imagined myself as a tracker following an animal through the forest, looking for any tracks or traces of my quarry. I didn't hear anything from the site the next day, and was beginning to give up hope that I'd been selected for the game. Maybe I had applied too late. I was at work, going about my usual boring office job, when at around 3 p.m. my phone buzzed. My heart skipped a beat. I knew it could have been any manner of notification that I'd just received, but I so badly wanted it to be something from the site. Checking it, there was an icon of an email on my scroll bar, showing me the newest mail I'd received. The address was a garbled mess of characters, but the subject read Game On. My heart jumped out of my chest. It had been selected to play. Images of chasing hiders throughout the city filled my mind as I smiled to myself. Yes, I thought, I'm in. That same sense of excitement had welled up again, as well as a feeling of anticipation. Clicking on the mail, it loaded with the same branding as the site I'd found yesterday. The same man in the suit and mask holding his thumbs up in a good luck gesture. The game is on. Find your team below and remember once you're in, you're in. I hastily scrolled down my excitement peaking as I reached the section showing the teams. My heart sank a little as I saw which team I was assigned to. I was in the hiders team. There were 24 others and me on the team. Their photos and mine were all present so that we could identify each other. I was amazed by the varying ages of the people who were in my team. They seemed to vary from teenagers to people in their mid to late fifties. I'm glad this isn't a team game. I thought to myself, some of these people don't look like they can run, let alone hide. Underneath the section showing me and the other hiders was a section called Hunters. It showed each of the other 25 people on the Hunters team. I looked through them all, concentrating hard to try and memorize their faces. I didn't want to get caught by doing something stupid like passing one of them in the street and not recognizing them. Although I was disappointed that I was on the hiders team, I still wanted to play and hopefully win. The message was signed off with just one sentence, good luck, don't get caught. I was shaking with excitement now, it was actually happening. As I closed the email, I looked around with nervous excitement, half expecting to see a hunter snooping around for me already. I was relieved when I didn't see anyone, although I knew now that the game was on. I couldn't stay here. It would be too obvious. These hunters knew my name. It wouldn't be too hard for them to go on social media and figure out where I worked. I cringed as I imagined being chased by a hunter through the office, with my co-workers staring at me, dumbfounded. I needed to get out of here. I needed the freedom to move. Making my way into my boss's office, I told her that I was feeling ill and needed the rest of the day off. 
I put on a stellar performance if I do say so myself, doubling over at one point, retching. She told me to go home and rest with a panicked look stricken across her face. I think she was worried I may have blown chunks all over her pristine office. Happy with this result, I thanked her in my best sick voice and slowly staggered out of her office. It wasn't until I'd made my way out of the main block and into the car park that I dropped the facade. I made my way to my car, all the while darting between the concrete columns of the car park, scanning the area for any signs of hunters. I was met with the stillness of the multi-story car park and the sound of the wind blowing between the concrete. It looked empty, but you couldn't be too careful. That childish excitement welled up in me as I started to lose myself in a sea of nostalgia, remembering how I would feel when I hid as a child. I made it to my car without incident, darting behind the concrete pillars before finally swinging myself in and locking the door. If anyone was hiding out there, they wouldn't be able to get me while I was in here. I was safe for now, but I couldn't just sit in my car for two weeks. I had a plan in my head. I would go somewhere with a large group of people, somewhere I could get lost in the crowd. Sure, it was risky with the chance that I might bump into a hunter, but I'd be harder to pick out that way, and if I got chased, there would be a mass of people to get between me and my pursuer. My mind immediately went to the mall. It was always busy, and there were several shops I could dart into if I saw any hunters. I could also get a snack if I wanted to, and I wouldn't need to leave my hiding spot if I needed the bathroom. It was genius. Satisfied with my plan, I started the car and made my way out of the empty car park, giddy with excitement thinking about all of the money I could win. I pulled out onto the main road, busy with its regular traffic. The sun was shining and everything felt great. I was on top of the world. I began thinking about how to evade a hunter if I saw one in the mall. Images of jumping over the aisles in the shops or throwing down mannequins to block my path filled my mind, and I chuckled to myself. As I was daydreaming, driving along, I came to a stop at a crossroads. I was waiting at the red light, reaching down to grab a bottle of cola from my passenger seat when something reached my ears. It sounded like the screeching of wheels spinning on the tarmac. Some boy racer must have been trying to race one of the other cars at the stoplight. Bloody tool, I thought to myself, i.e. There was an ear-shattering bang and everything began to spin. My vision blurred as I jerked violently to the side, slamming my head on the dashboard as the car seemed to slide sideways. I shouted out a startled scream as the bottle of cola was thrown through the air. The scent of burning rubber thick in the air and the sound of shattering glass filled my ears. The sound was deafening. I had a persistent ringing in my head for several seconds afterwards. Dazed, it took me a few moments to realize where I was. I was terrified. I didn't know what was going on. As my senses began to come back to me, I realized that the passenger door seemed much closer to me now, resting just below my arm. There was something behind it that blocked the rest of the street from view, something large and dark with smoke billowing from it. I shook my head, confused, feeling the rush of wind on my face from the now gaping hole where the windscreen of the car had once been. The sound of screaming came from somewhere in the distance. I couldn't make out exactly where. There was a metallic taste in my mouth and my chest felt heavy. What the hell, I thought. What just happened? Then it clicked. The bang, the burning rubber, the missing windscreen, and the broken door. I looked out of the passenger window again and realized that the black shape was the front of a large black pickup truck. Someone had slammed right into the side of my car on the passenger side. They must have been traveling pretty fast as both cars were totaled. Rage welled up in me. How badly must that asshole have been driving to have hit me? I was stationary after all. They best have insurance. I could see faint movement through the windscreen of the other car. The driver must still be in there. I forgot about the game and focused on what was happening. As angry as I was that someone had totaled my car and nearly killed me, they were still in their car and might be hurt. I sat up and reached my hand for my door when I noticed the warm feeling on the left side of my face. Reaching my hand up and touching my face, my fingers were stuck with red when I pulled them away. I must have been hit pretty hard, I thought, staring at the blood on my fingers. 
I took in a sharp breath to scream and doubled over. Two of my ribs felt like they were being torn apart, my lungs pushing against their now shattered remains. I tried my best to shake the pain off. Thankfully, I was still numb from the adrenaline. Reaching for the door handle again, I pushed it, and it moved, only to jam shut inches from opening. I sighed and tried it again, throwing myself against it. Immediately, my ribs flared in protest, and I had to take a second to catch my breath. The door still stood closed. As I was doubled over, I noticed the windscreen again. It had been shattered by the impact, leaving only a giant hole. I should be able to climb out of that to freedom. Without much more thought, I started to pull myself from the windscreen and out into the now still crossroads. The smell of burnt rubber was stronger out here. There was also a very strong petrol stench filling my nostrils. One of the fuel tanks must be leaking, putting in a great deal of effort not to stumble and fall. My world spun as I slid from the bonnet of the car and tried to stand up. I couldn't tell if I was shaking from adrenaline, my shattered ribs, or from the crash, but I had to lean against the car to steady myself. As I raised my head above my now-destroyed vehicle, flecks of shattered glass covering everything I could see like transparent snowflakes, I was able to get a better look at the car that had hit me. I was right. It was a large, black pickup truck. It had hit me dead on the side, crumpling my poor Cleo instantly. From the looks of the rubber marks on the road, it had moved me several feet onto the pavement. I could see smoke hissing from under its now crumpled hood, its wheels jutting out at odd angles. There were several pedestrians looking on at the scene, horrified. That would explain the screaming I'd heard. I think some of them looked like they were making their way over to me, but I needed to focus on my task at hand, the other driver. I'd never been in a real car crash before. I'd seen videos online, but they didn't prepare me for this. I needed to get to the other driver to make sure they were safe. From where I was standing, I couldn't see into the car. Its window was shattered, although I could make out frantic movement from the inside. The driver was alive and they obviously needed help. I staggered around to the front of the car towards their driver's side window. They appeared to be frantically fighting with their seat belt, aggressively tugging at it with both hands, attempting to get free. It must be jammed, I thought to myself. But there was something that didn't feel right about this. The way the driver was acting was odd. He wasn't panicked, he seemed frantic, but not in a shocked way. I made my way closer and knocked on his window. As I tapped on the broken glass, it lost whatever integrity it had left, falling to the floor in tiny crystal droplets. The driver whirled around to face me, staring me dead in the eyes. I stared back, all the while that odd feeling of apprehension buzzing in the back of my mind. Then my stomach dropped as I realized why I felt this way. He was a hunter. I recognized his face from the pictures in the email that I'd received. He was a hunter and he was after me. He must have seen me sitting there at the crossroads and tried to take his opportunity. Then another thought hit me, making my already weak legs nearly give way. If this man was willing to T-bone my car for this game, what else was he willing to do? I know there are no rules banning things like this, but then again, there weren't many rules at all. I didn't know what this man was capable of, and I really didn't want to find out. With lightning speed, he shot his arm out of the window and grabbed my wrist. His grip was tight and snapped me out of my stare. His eyes were still fixed on me, and I could almost feel his determination to catch me. Rather than the giddy excitement that I'd felt earlier, now all I felt was fear. I needed to get away as fast as I could. All that mattered was putting as much distance between myself and him as I could. I jerked my arm back with all of my strength, ripping it from his grip. He swore loudly, turning his attention back to his seatbelt, frantically yanking at it, trying to rip it from its socket to chase after me. I silently thanked my lucky stars that it had jammed when he crashed. Otherwise, who knows what state I would have been in. Terrified, I turned on my heel and began to stagger away. All the while I could hear the muffled shouts of anger coming from the hunter's black pickup as he struggled in vain against the seatbelt restraining him. My mind was scattered and my head was pounding. I was pretty sure I had a concussion, but I carried on moving. I could just about see the mall from where I was. 
once I was there, I could still carry out my plan. Winning wasn't the main thing on my mind at the moment. If all of the hunters were like this man, I didn't want to encounter any more of them. What if they were worse? Then I heard a sound that made my blood turn to ice. The slamming of heavy feet against the tarmac behind me, getting closer. I turned around, already knowing what to expect, but needing to see it anyway. The hunter was closing the distance between us. The pedestrians I saw must have helped him loose, and now he was free to pursue me. Unlike me, he seemed practically uninjured by the crash. He was running at full speed, closing the minuscule distance between us. I had to get away. Turning to my left, I could see them all, so close. If I could just make it there, I could lose him in the crowd. All that stood between me and it was a busy main road, the cars flying by, oblivious to my plight. I couldn't see any way across, not that I'd be able to get to without being caught. Taking a deep breath, knowing that if I didn't move soon, that would be it. This lunatic would catch me, and who knows what state I'd be in at the capture location. Lurching forward, I staggered across the busy main road, taking the most direct route to the mall. I knew it was dangerous, but the terror of running across an active main road was far more appealing than the terror of what an unknown psychotic hunter would do if he had the chance. Cars veered around me as I limped slowly across, honking their horns in angry protest at my presence. I felt the wind off a couple of them, just narrowly avoiding hitting me. I even felt the cold metal of a large van as it whipped past me, but I didn't care. All I could think about was that mall, with the people in the shops and all of the hiding places. Looking back over my shoulder, my breath caught in my throat. The hunter was charging across the road at me. I was certain that he wouldn't have followed me across this road, that it would have been suicidal. But there he was, clumsily dodging in and out of the traffic. Another shot of adrenaline coursed through me. I could feel my aching ribs and thumping head, but the pain was dulled. I threw everything I had into getting across that road, my legs protesting at how hard I was pushing them. With one final effort, I managed to dance around the front of a large Ford, the wind from it rippling the back of my shirt as it narrowly avoided smearing me across the tarmac. I stumbled onto the embankment on the other side, and a small sense of relief washed over me. I'd made it. All that stood between me and the mall was the parking lot out front. That relief was short-lived, however, as the ear-splitting beep of a car horn reminded me of the hunter still pursuing me. I ran as hard as I could for the mall, my heart pounding in my ears, my legs screaming and my lungs burning in my chest. I was nearly there. I could still hear the hunter's footsteps slamming across the road, mixed with the honking of the annoyed motorists. I was so focused on the mall that it seemed distant, far off. All that mattered to me all that I allowed myself to perceive was the mall in front of me. I only snapped back when I heard a loud, frantic series of honks, followed by a screaming screech of rubber behind me, then a petrified scream and the solid crunch of a metallic crash, followed by the subtle tinkling of falling shards of glass. There were several other heavy crashes and several more screaming horns that followed, creating a deafening cacophony. Still running, I chanced to glance over my shoulder. With a morbid sense of relief, I surveyed the scene behind me. There was a massive pileup on the road. There must have been at least ten cars, all crumpled into a single horrific scrap pile. Other drivers were getting out of their cars to help the people still trapped in the mangled wreckage. It looked awful. Some of the cars behind had spilled across the embankment to get away, only to be hit by cars coming the other way. The entire road was filled with scattered parts and glass from this morbid blockade. It was awful, and I felt terrible for thinking it, but the only thought that came to my mind in that instance was how thankful I was that I couldn't see the hunter anymore. Barely waiting for the automatic doors to open, I forced myself through and made my way inside the bustling mall, thankful that there had been no trace of that hunter since the pileup. Walking through the crowded shopping center, I kept my head on a swivel, constantly scanning for any sign of hunters. Although I was relieved to have lost the one chasing me, the last thing I wanted was for another one to immediately spot me. 
I wasn't enjoying this anymore. I genuinely felt hunted like an animal. This wasn't what I signed up for. As I walked, I noticed the horrified looks from the passers-by. They seemed to be making a conscious effort to avoid me, like I was some kind of social pariah. Then I remembered my face was covered in blood from the crash. I must have looked horrific. No wonder no one would walk near me. I couldn't blame them. There's no way I'd be able to blend in looking like this. I rushed to the nearest bathroom and ran to the mirror to assess the damage to my face. The bloodied man staring back at me in the mirror looked worse for wear. Drying red blood covered the majority of his face, stemming from some kind of injury at the top of his head. I felt a little woozy seeing my own blood like that. I knew I had some on my fingers when I checked earlier, but I wasn't expecting to see so much. Splashing the cold water of the sink into my face a few times in an effort to clear it, it turned out that it wasn't so bad. I had a nasty-looking cut on the side of my head. It had bled profusely, but other than that, I was unscathed. I was relieved that I wasn't bleeding to death. I don't think I had the mental capacity to deal with that right now. I tried to tidy myself up as best as I could, all the while on edge, jumping at any sounds that came to my ears. The sound of the bathroom door opening and closing, the hand dryer blaring or the toilets flushing sparking a jolt of fear. What if they were caused by another hunter coming to finish what the first one started? When I was done, I didn't look too bad. I didn't look great. But I also didn't look like I'd just been in a car crash. Making my way back out and into the hustle and bustle of the mall, I pretended to browse shop windows, inspect the food court, and just act like a general mall goer. My nerves were shot, but I tried my best to just blend in. I'd made a large loop for myself, wandering up one length of the mall, making a left turn into a subsequent section, then taking the escalator upstairs to do a loop of the top level before returning back to my original starting position. Stopping occasionally, I'd pretend to have an interest in the shop windows, using their reflective surfaces to covertly look at the passers-by. I was getting into the swing of it now, blending in with the crowd, when I noticed movement that caught my attention. It was a short distance away, moving fast, cutting a line through the crowd. My heart jumped into my throat as my thoughts flashed back to the hunter and the way he ran across that road after me. I was just about to turn and run, assuming that this person was a hunter that had seen me, when I noticed the person looking over their shoulder frantically as though someone might be following them. As I got a better look at their face, I recognized them immediately from their photo in the email. It was another one of the hiders, someone on my team. She was young, maybe in her late teens, with long black hair and thin lined glasses. I will say that I did feel a slight sense of joy when I saw her, not enough to forget what had happened with my car. But it was just nice to be reminded that I wasn't alone in this. As soon as I saw her, I immediately scanned the aria, assuming she was being so frantic because she was being followed. Looking back through the trail she'd made, I expected to see a second form charging through the mass of people after her. Much to my relief, there was no one. The mall was as bustling and inconspicuous as it had ever been, with people going back to their business after the girl shot past them. I decided to go and introduce myself to my fellow teammate, after all, strength in numbers. She'd made her way into one of the nearby clothing shops, brushing past several shoppers, nearly knocking some of them over as she hurriedly tried to get out of sight as fast as she could. I followed her as closely as I dared, trying not to look obvious so as to not arouse suspicion in case she was being tailed. She must not have encountered any of the hunters yet. Otherwise, she wouldn't be running around like this. I thought to myself, worried. I'd best warn her. She may not know what she's in for. Eventually, I caught up to her. Watching her, she'd stopped in a far section of the shop, pretending to look at some of the coats hanging from a tall rack. I sidled up to her as inconspicuously as I could. As I got closer, she stared at me with a look of shock and horror on her face, beginning to start turning to run before her expression eventually softened as the realization clicked. And you're playing too? She exclaimed in an excited whisper. It's good to see another friendly face. You need to be more careful. 
I chastised immediately, trying to be quiet so as any other shoppers passing by wouldn't overhear. You're drawing too much attention to yourself moving around like that. These hunters, they don't mess around. As I said this, I gestured to the cut along the side of my head. The color seemed to drain from her face as she saw my wound. What the hell? Did they do that to you? She seemed genuinely horrified. Yeah, one of them is a real psycho. He totaled my car to try and catch me. I only got away because a car crashed into him when he chased me across the road outside the mall. I've not seen any more of them yet, but if they're anything like him, I don't want to. They're insane. She seemed to go quiet after this, as though the gravity of the situation was suddenly sinking in. The color drained from her face a little as she tried to process this revelation. Okay, what do we do then? Maybe we could team up? Watch each other's backs? She whispered nervously, her voice shaking as she looked at me with a pleading fear in her eyes. Maybe we can avoid these psychos, win this thing? Looking at her, I tried to weigh my options from a tactical perspective. She was far shorter and lighter than me. If a hunter wanted to, they would easily be able to physically restrain her and bring her in. If I left her alone, she would surely be caught, one less hider on my team to share the prize with if I won. But then there would be fewer hiders for the hunters to go after. So I would become a bigger target. I would also be on my own, so if I slipped up, that would be it. There would be no one watching out for me. After quickly deliberating, I extended my hand to her. Sure thing, name's David. But I guess you already knew that from the email? She took my hand, shaking it in a firm grip, a look of relief spreading across her face. Nice to meet you, David. My name's Jenny, and likewise. We should get moving, I said, glancing around, aware that we'd been standing in this same position now for a few minutes. I don't like staying still for too long. Follow me, just act like you're window shopping and try to blend in. I wish I'd known now what was going to happen. If I did, maybe I'd have done things differently. I'll get into the details, but right now I need to move. I've been here too long already. I'll post the rest of this when I get to a safer place. I've managed to find somewhere safe to hide while I post this, but again, I can't stay here for long. I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. So last time I posted, I just met another hider, Jenny, and we'd agreed to team up. As we made our way out of that shop and back into the teeming masses outside, we tried our best to blend in. We walked close together, acting like close friends to try and avoid suspicion. So what are you going to do if you win the money? She asked me, curiously. Truth be told, I hadn't got an exact idea of what I would do with the money if I won. I knew it would be great to have that amount of money, but there was nothing specific that I could put my finger on. You know, I'm not too sure, to be honest. I'll probably just buy myself a new house and a PlayStation and never work again. To be honest, I mainly joined as I thought a massive game of hide-and-seek would be fun. God knows I was wrong, I said. My voice dropped as I thought about the hunter again. Jenny let out a laugh. Wow, you're thinking small scale. If I win, I'm going to use the money to finally move out of my parents' house. I love them both, but God knows I need my own space. I might even get a city apartment or something and try to start my own business. The world would be my oyster, she said, a faraway look overtaking her. I felt for her. She was just a young adult wanting to make a new start in life. I felt a pang of guilt, knowing that I'd considered abandoning her for a larger share of the prize. We continued to walk and talk like this for about an hour or so. I would scan around for hunters, keeping my eyes locked onto the faces of passers-by. Jenny would do the same, pretending to look in shop windows while using the reflections in the glass to screen nearby shoppers. I'm not going to lie, it felt good not to be on my own. I was really enjoying our little partnership. We were a team, and for the first time since that car crash, I really felt like things were starting to look up and that we could genuinely do this. After a few more loops around the mall, we were both starving, deciding to get something to eat. There was no sense in not eating just because we were hiding. We'd be weak and easy pickings. In fact, it would add to our cover, what with how busy it would be. 
Just two normal friends getting dinner together, I argued. I could tell from Jenny's expression that she thought it was a great idea, even if she did seem slightly apprehensive about the hunters. As casually as we could, we made our way to the food court, all the while keeping up the facade of being regular shoppers. The smells of pizza and burgers filled my nostrils, causing my stomach to gurgle loudly. Practically salivating at this point, I told Jenny we needed to pick up the pace before I passed out. From the lack of protest from her, she must have been in the same position. Passing several people as we entered the courtyard, that was the food court, we didn't see any signs of hunters. We'd actually only had one close call all afternoon when Jenny panicked, thinking that she'd spotted one in a queue in a candle shop. We both made a speedy getaway, frantically checking back in the opposite direction. But after checking through the email again, she realized she'd made a mistake. Unless the hunter had somehow grown a beard in the last few hours, it wasn't anything to worry about. So then, what are you feeling? I asked her. I was too hungry to decide. Everything looked delicious, so I hoped she had something particular in mind. Erm, um, pizza maybe? She floated as her eyes locked on a deep pan pizza stand. Good choice, I exclaimed. We each ordered a large pizza. Meat lovers for me, pepperoni and peppers for her. Making our way over to the seating area to eat, the delicious smell of molten cheese began filling our nostrils. We were ravenous, and as I devoured the first heavenly slice of that pizza, I felt my stomach grumble thankfully. We had sat down, pizza slices in hand, when I decided to do one last scan of the area. As my eyes moved from person to person, I'd nearly completed my sweep when I saw something that made me drop the slice of pizza I was holding. Another hunter was sitting at the other end of the food court. I'd not seen him on the way in. He'd been obscured by one of the central pillars. He'd obviously had the same idea about refueling as us. Kicking myself for being so careless, I was thankful that the hunter was equally as unaware of his surroundings. He was focused on the large burger on the plate in front of him. Jenny, I hissed in a hushed tone. She turned to face me, a slice of pizza inches away from her mouth. She picked up on the urgency in my voice, staring at me wide-eyed. Yeah? Don't look straight away and for God's sake be inconspicuous, but I think there's a hunter sitting at the other end of the food court. Over there in the corner, by the pillar. What? Oh God! She shakily replied panic breaking out across her face. Slowly, she turned her head to look at him, waiting a few seconds as though pretending to read the menu of a nearby stall before looking back at me. Nope, I don't see anyone, she sighed, sounding relieved. What, are you sure? I could swear it was one of the guys from the email, I hissed again, confused. I swear it was one of the hunters, I was convinced. Nope, he's just a normal guy. Another false alarm, she said jovially, smiling at me with a reassuring smile. Thank God I swear he looks just like one of those guys. I sighed, relieved, as I turned around casually to look again. As my eyes swept across the food court, my eyes locked onto the man in the corner again. Before they had a chance to focus, I felt a searing pain in my head, and the world went black as I fell from my chair with an almighty clatter. When the world came back to me, I could hear muffled shouting and screams, my vision swimming as I woke up on the floor. There were people running, yelling, and screaming over one another. Why was I on the floor? As I tried to focus on the sounds, I could hear another more familiar voice breaking through over the rest. It took me a while to figure out who it was, but as I did, I felt a sting of pain in my heart. Hey you, over here, we got a hider. That voice, it was Jenny. What the hell was she doing? Mustering what felt like a gargantuan amount of effort, I forced myself over and onto my side. Jenny was standing above me, looking over me towards the other end of the food court. You're a hunter, right? Well, come and get him. This one's for free. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. What was she doing? I felt a pang of tears along with the confusion welling up inside me. I thought we were a team. Jenny? I managed to force out, weakly. She turned down to look at me. 
an expression of genuine sadness creeping across her face. I'm really sorry, David, but I really need the money. You understand, right? It's just a game after all, she said, before turning on her heel and running as fast as she could, disappearing into the crowd. I watched her as she went, tears filling my eyes. I was so embarrassed, so confused. Pain filled my heart as a stream of thoughts flooded my mind. How could she have betrayed me like this, handing me over to the hunters? I thought we were a great team, and I was really starting to like her. Then anger welled up within me as I kicked myself for being so stupid. Why had I thought trusting another hider was a good idea? I should have seen this coming, what with the large prize and all. I can't say I wouldn't have done the same if I hadn't already had an encounter with the hunters. As she ran, I could see her tuck something into her bag. It looked shiny and metallic, like a small handgun. A terrifying thought burst to the front of my brain, causing my blood to run cold and my vision to swim again. My head was pounding. Had she shot me? Shakily, I raised my hand to my head, dreading the gaping hole that I would find where part of my skull used to be. Frantically touching my head, relief washed over me as I realized my head felt like it did before albeit a bit more sore. She must have hit me around the back of the head with the butt of the gun when my back was turned. Anger welled up again as I couldn't believe that I'd let myself get that comfortable. She was a stranger after all. She'd done nothing to earn my trust other than be on the hider's team and make me laugh a couple of times. Still, the betrayal hurt though. I was snapped back to the current moment by the sounds of screams getting closer to me, spinning my head to my left I could see a line of people being forcefully parted in the sea of shoppers before me, the hunter. In all of my confusion and grief about Jenny's betrayal, I'd forgotten that the hunter would be coming to get me. He was barreling through the crowd, quickly closing the distance between us. Frantically, I tried my best to get to my feet, slipping and stumbling as the world span. Adrenaline helped me to get enough composure to run semi-coherently. My mind was scrambled. The only thought occupying it now was that I needed to get away. Although I had no idea where to go, I started running in the opposite direction to the screams. It was all I could think to do. I broke into a loping sprint, trying to force my legs to work faster while also not collapsing from underneath me. The screams behind me seemed to get louder in a deafening crescendo, as another sound ripped through the air that made the blood freeze in my veins. An explosion of powder from one of the tiles near my right foot accompanied it, and I had to make a physical effort to keep control of my already failing legs. A gunshot. That lunatic hunter was shooting at me. All sense left me at this point. This was even worse than the one that crashed into me with his car. How was this allowed? The rules had said they couldn't kill or incapacitate me, but there was nothing about slowing me down by shooting my leg or maiming me. It wasn't something that occurred to me at the time. Then darker thoughts raced through my mind, causing a shiver to run down my spine. There were hardly any limits to what they could do to catch me. As long as I was intact and not dead, the organizers would count that as acceptable. Whirling from this new realization, pure survival instinct carried me. I needed to get away. More than just winning the game counted on it now. Running as fast as I could, I ran through corridor after corridor of the mall, shops flying by at breakneck speed. The fog in my brain from being dazed had now completely cleared with the sound of that gunshot. I hardly felt the throbbing in my head anymore or the protesting of my burning legs. All that mattered was getting away from this psycho with a gun. I don't know how long I'd been running for, but the screams and thundering footsteps behind me told me that the hunter wasn't giving up. I could still hear his frantic footsteps coming from behind me as the screams from mall goers rose up. Another shot flew past me when I rounded the corner to one of the corridors on my right, narrowly missing where my left shoulder had been. My lungs were burning, each breath feeling like liquid fire. Although my head wasn't throbbing anymore, I could tell deep down that something was wrong. My legs were beginning to shake from the exertion and my chest felt tighter with each breath my shattered ribs screaming for me to stop. The car crash must have done more damage than I initially released. Horror filled me as I realized there was no way I'd be able to keep this up. I couldn't outrun him. I had to hide. It was the only way I might get out of this. 
panic-stricken, I scanned around frantically, looking for anywhere that might conceal me, somewhere that would allow me to catch my breath and lose my tail. After what felt like too long searching, I spotted a small island in the middle of the corridor up ahead. The concrete edges were around two feet tall and there were several plants growing within it that would hide me if I could just get to the other side. Summoning one last effort, I pushed myself, my burning lungs rattling as I gulped down fresh breaths of air. Skidding clumsily to a halt, I dived behind it, spreading myself across the floor and pressing against the sides of the concrete base, trying to conceal myself against it. I heard the frantic steps of the hunter just moments after, entering the corridor. They seemed to slow, obviously noticing I was nowhere to be seen. My heart pounded in my chest as slowly they made their way closer to my hiding spot. If they looked around and saw me, that would be it. There was no way I'd be able to get up and run again in time. I closed my eyes, expecting the worst, only for them to come to a stop a few meters away from where I had concealed myself. I waited, every fiber of my being shaking, for the sound of the footsteps to leave or move into one of the other shops. I don't know how long I sat like that, listening, praying that the maniac with the gun would just leave. I could hear my heart beating in my ears and my shallow breathing like they were amplified. After what felt like several minutes, I dared a glance over the edge of the concrete that concealed me. If I was careful, the plants would conceal me and allow me to at least get a better look at the hunter. Slowly counting down in my mind, I gingerly raised my head. Obscured by the leaves of the plants on the island, I could make him out clearly. He was sitting on the benches opposite my hiding place, pretending to look at the surrounding shops. My heart sank a little as I realized he must have assumed I was hiding in one of them and was waiting for me to come out. I could see the glint of black metal partially concealed by his coat, drawing my attention. He still had his hand on the gun, ready and waiting. I couldn't stay here like this. All it would take was for him to walk over this way, and he would see me. Frantically scanning around, I looked for any possible means of escape. After several dead ends, my eyes locked on a door to my left marked maintenance. A thought began forming, if I was lucky, maybe, just maybe, it would be unlocked and I could lose him in the tunnels. I began weighing up my options in my mind. I could say here and possibly get caught when the hunter got bored of waiting and decided on a more thorough examination or I could make a run for that door and hopefully lose him. I'd need to be quick though. If I could get in there as fast as I could, then maybe he wouldn't see me. He might just think it was a member of staff. I didn't like the plan. The idea of running again made me feel sick. My head and chest were screaming with pain, but I didn't have any more options. And if I stayed here, I doubted my head and chest would be the only parts of me in pain. I had to do this. If I waited for him to look the other way and ran, I might be through the door before he had a chance to look back. Glancing through the leaves again, his attention seemed to be fixed on one of the shops to his left. This was it. I didn't like it, but I didn't know when I would get another chance. Shakily, and as quickly as I could, I got to my feet and broke into a charge, slamming full pelt into the door, bursting through it and into the concrete-lined tunnels behind. This was it, I thought anticipation welling up in me. I'd be free. A shot rang out and one of the blocks in front of me spat out a small explosion of powder. My heart sank like a stone. So much for that he'd seen me. All I could do now was run, skidding around the corner of the access corridor into a much longer one. There were several workers in this area, all on their lunch breaks. When they caught sight of me running around the corner, they began angrily yelling at me that I shouldn't be in there. I ignored them, screaming at them to get back, to get away from the maniac with the gun behind me. I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if this hunter accidentally caught one of them in the crossfire because I'd decided to try and escape down this corridor. They just stared at me blankly, confused expressions plastered over their faces. All the while, the echoing footsteps of my pursuer were bouncing around the walls. I carried on running turning again around another corner and vanishing from the sight of the workers. Frantically, my eyes scanned the area, looking for a way out or another hiding place. 
They settled on a door underneath a glowing red sign marked Exit. If I could get outside, then maybe I could lose him in the parking lot or find somewhere else to hide. There was a commotion from behind me that made my scalp tighten. The raised voices of the workers and the shouting of the hunter, before an almighty bang from another shot and the screams of the workers. Then the footsteps started up again, getting closer. I was terrified. I had images of the hunter shooting one of the workers for trying to stop him. Them now lying in a pool of their own blood surrounded by their colleagues just because I'd decided to run through these corridors. I mustered what little resolve I had left and charged for the exit door, knowing that there was nothing I could do for them now. Another shot from behind me indicated my pursuer was still on my tail. I noticed a horrible burning sensation in my left calf, but I tried my best to ignore it. It wasn't important right now. I just needed to escape. A warm trickle made its way down my calf and into my sock, soaking it slowly. I knew that if I looked at my leg, whatever composure I had left would leave me and I would surely be caught. Dragging my injured leg behind me as I reached the door, I frantically forced it open. Thankfully, it was unlocked. I ran through before slamming it shut behind me. Looking around at my surroundings, I was in a courtyard surrounded by a chain-link fence. There were several dumpsters and other random piles of trash scattered throughout the courtyard. This must have been the mall's waste disposal area, I thought to myself. Eyes darting around for anything I could use to barricade the door, I noticed a discarded metal chair from the food court just to my left. I grabbed it and forced it under the handle of the door. It wasn't going to stop someone from getting through forever. The flimsy metal would buckle long before that, but it would at least slow them down. Turning back around, my heart sank as I scanned the area. I knew I wouldn't be able to clamber over that fence easily, not with enough time to run away without getting shot. There didn't look like there were any other exits either, only this fence and the door behind me. The only thing I could do now was hide. But then would the hunter be expecting that? It would be pretty obvious, as there would be nowhere else for me to go. I began to feel the tickling fingers of despair clawing at my mind, and I realized how hopeless my situation was. Then like a flash, an idea began forming in my head. With renewed vigor, I limped over to the chain link fence, my calf now throbbing in time with my heartbeat, my socks squelching with each step. Reaching out a hand, I grasped the cold metal of the fence between my fingers. With a determined breath, I shook the fence as hard as I could, making as much noise as it would allow me to. After a few seconds, I stopped shaking the metal and jumped, landing as loudly as I possibly could. Over my shoulder, I could hear the banging coming from the door that I'd blocked with the chair. The hunter was trying to force it open, throwing his weight against it. I was banking on the fact that he'd heard the racket I'd made with the fence. I needed this to work. Moving over to the nearest dumpster and holding my breath, I slowly and gently opened the lid, trying to be as quiet as possible. I was dreading this part of my plan. Hiding in a dumpster wasn't something I would enjoy, but if it meant I got away without being shot again, then it was something I was going to have to do. Gazing over the edge of the huge metal container, I could see several black bin bags. A waft of stale air clung to my nostrils, but I wasn't met with the horrific stench I was expecting. Still, I dreaded to think of the rotting food and disgusting creatures that might be residing in this dumpster. Vomit tickled its way up my throat just thinking about it. I was beginning to have second thoughts. Considering checking another dumpster, perhaps there was an empty one. I was about to turn around when I heard a cracking noise from the door and knew that the chair holding it wasn't long for this world. Fear rising in me again, I bit the bullet, clambering into the dumpster as quietly as I could. As my feet touched the bags, they seemed to sink in, absorbed by the black plastic. But they weren't met with a slimy consistency like I was expecting. Relieved, I noted that it was the opposite. The bags felt quite soft, almost fluffy. Looking down again, I saw through a split in one of the bin bags that they were filled with clothing. I thanked my lucky stars I must have chosen a bin from one of the clothing outlets. The banning from the door snapped me back to the task at hand. Quickly I closed the dumpster lid, trying to be as quiet as possible. 
Almost as soon as I'd snapped that lid into place, I heard an almighty crack as the chair blocking the door shattered. In the darkness of the dumpster, I heard the door slam as it was thrown open and bounced against the wall. The sound of frustrated footsteps echoed throughout the courtyard as the hunter made his way outside. I could hear him muttering something to himself as he searched for me. I closed my eyes and waited with bated breath. I could hear him walking around in what seemed like circles, looking for me. Then everything went silent. My mind went wild in the dark, all manner of thoughts about what the hunter could be doing bubbling up in my brain. Was he going to wait here expecting that I was hiding? Would he leave and come back later? Or would he assume that I'd made it over the fence and climb it himself? It felt like hours that I sat there, all the while just waiting for the lid of the dumpster to fly back and an arm to reach in and grab me. Then there was an almighty slam as a pile of trash at the other end of the yard was toppled over. The sound caught me off guard and before I could stop myself, a little whimper escaped my lips. The sound stopped immediately and I heard another sound that made the color drain from my face. The footsteps had started up again and they were getting closer. Each footstep I heard cut through the cold silence of the dumpster and echoed around in my head. I could hear my heart beating in my chest. It couldn't end like this. I'd spent so much time and effort, experienced so much fear. I'd survived a car crash, running across a main road and being shot, only to be captured in a dumpster, like a fish in a barrel. All because I couldn't suppress one stupid sound. The only thing I could think to do was to press myself as hard as I could into the bags. It seemed pointless, but there was nothing else I could do. I was trapped. Quickly but quietly, I moved the bags around me and covered myself, trying to become as small as possible. I lay there, waiting for the hunter to rip the lid from the dumpster and find me here. I was just about to accept my fate when I heard something I wasn't expecting. An almighty rattle followed by a heavy thud, then quick footsteps leading away from me. I almost cried. My ruse must have worked. He must have thought I'd climbed the fence and ran away through the houses on the other side. I let out a shaking breath, my body untensing, as a huge wave of relief washed over me. Still, I waited for several minutes before moving. After all, this may have been a trap. Pressing my ear to the cold metal of the dumpster, I listened carefully with bated breath for any sign that there was still someone out there. When no sounds met my ears, I slowly slid back the lid of the dumpster, slowly poking my head out as I chanced to look into the courtyard. It was abandoned, just as I found it. The only indication that the hunter had been here was the scattered remains of the chair I'd used on the door and a ransacked pile of trash on the other end of the yard. Joy washed over me as I realized I'd evaded him. Thank God I'd managed to escape. I knew I couldn't stay here, though. It was too dangerous. If the hunters were going to use methods like this, then populated places wouldn't work. I'd need somewhere out of the way. Somewhere that no one would ever think to look at and that had several places I could easily hide. Racking my brains, my mind wandered to a small internet cafe that I frequented. It was a little place down a side street on the outskirts of town. Normally you'd find three or four people there maximum. Yes, I thought to myself, it would be perfect as long as I did not get sloppy and get followed. I began to make my way there. The hunter had jumped the fence, and I wasn't about to follow him, so I decided that it would be best for me to make my way back through the mall. I knew it was dangerous as there were far less people around now with it being nearly closing time, but it was still safer than taking my chances going the same way as the hunter. As I started to slowly limp back through the concrete maintenance tunnel, my leg burning with each step, I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket. It was funny. In all of the fear and panic, I'd forgotten it was even there. Thank God it didn't go off when I was in the dumpster. I shuddered at the thought. Pulling it out of my pocket and unlocking the screen, it was shattered. Ah, crap. Probably from the crash, I sighed. Annoyed at the fact that I would now need to buy a new phone. I could still make out a notification at the top of the screen. It was an email. Dragging down the navigation bar, I could see that it was from the same garbled mess of characters that had sent the mail before. 
Even with everything that happened, I'm pretty sure that the contents of the email were the worst part of all of this. I need to move again. They're closing up shop now, so I need to find a new hiding place before the owners come up here. But I'll post the rest of this when I get to another safe spot. I've managed to find another safe place. Well, as safe as any place seems right now anyway. So much has changed since I last posted and I wasn't sure if I would get a chance to. Again, I'm still not sure if it's a good idea as they're undoubtedly monitoring me, but I don't care. I need to get this out there, even if nobody believes me. So in my last post, I'd just managed to escape from that psycho hunter who chased me through the mall after tricking him into thinking I jumped over a fence. I'd love to tell you that was the end of it, but then my phone buzzed with a notification. I don't think I quite understood how dire my situation was until I opened the notification. When I tapped on it, I could see that it was an email from the same garbled mess of characters that had sent the mail before. My stomach fluttered as I skimmed over the subject day one updates and ratings. I'll be honest, in all of the running and fearing for my life, I'd forgotten entirely about the game having a point system. I was too focused on survival. A sense of apprehension filled me as I read the subject again. This game wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I wondered how many other people were in my position or were worse off. Nervously, I tapped on the notification and opened the mail. The mail app loaded quickly, revealing a mail that was blank all bar a single URL. I couldn't make anything out of it. It was another garbled mess of characters, not from any site that I recognized. Tentatively, I hovered my finger over it, a warning tickle creeping up my spine before tapping it, not sure of exactly what to expect. As soon as my thumb made contact with the link, my phone screen went dark. Oh, great. Just great, I muttered to myself, frustrated. But after a second, the screen sprang back into life bursting into a flurry of activity. Several screens opened, then closed rapidly too quickly for me to make out what they were, although they looked similar to the command prompt windows you see on a computer. I had no idea what was going on. All I could do was stare at my phone helpless to stop whatever it was doing, but then as suddenly as it had all started, it all stopped. My phone was as still and silent as it was before. Sitting there on the home screen, waiting for my command. As I looked it over, I could make out only one sign that something had happened. There, in the center of my home screen, was a new app that I had never seen before and had no memory of downloading. It was a plain black square titled, The Devil's Games. Assuming that the app was some kind of malware that the game organizers had installed on my phone, and not trusting them in the slightest, nor wanting any more obstacles in this horrific game, I went to highlight it and remove it. Much to my confusion, it wouldn't budge. I pressed the uninstall button several times, but the app just sat there unperturbed, ignoring my requests. I was about to try again when the app opened by itself and plunged my phone screen into darkness. After a second, I could make out something in the center of the screen. It looked almost like a small video player embedded into the darkness. It was hard to see as it was nearly as dark as the background. Confused now, I didn't know what to think. Maybe it wasn't malware at all. Maybe it was just some janky app for them to send out updates to us players through. This game had been set up on the dark web after all, so nothing was top quality. Just as I was pondering this, the video in the center of the screen changed, catching my attention. I could make something out now. The quality was poor, very poor, as though whatever had been used to film it was either really old or streaming over an exceptionally low bandwidth. I brought the phone closer to my face, squinting through the pixels to try and make out some kind of detail. I could just about make out a dark room. It looked like there was a large wooden platform in the distance occupying the center with a tall podium in the middle. I couldn't see much else though. I also noticed a small number in the bottom right hand corner in plain white text. It seemed to be incrementing it was in the tens of thousands and still climbing at a steady rate. This was just strange. What the hell was this video even about? I was just about to close off the app when I noticed movement to the right of the stage. Something was happening. 
I sat there, my phone inches away from my face as what looked like a group of people made their way from the right-hand side of the screen. They were walking strangely, some limping, others holding injuries. They each had an odd look on their faces, but the feed was too poor for me to make it out. Once they reached the center of the stage, they split off into two groups, six of them staying on the right side and three moving off to the left. All the while, they were all looking over their shoulder to somewhere just off the right-hand side of the screen. It took me a second, but I realized that there must be someone just off-screen orchestrating where they were going. Just as the thought came to me, a large hooded figure wearing a mask moved into the frame on the stage going up to each of the nine people. I couldn't make out exactly what he was doing, but it looked like the people cowered as he approached, although none tried to defend themselves when he grabbed their hands. I was thoroughly confused. What the hell did this video have to do with rankings and what the hell was I watching? All the while that number in the bottom right corner was still going up, adding to my confusion. Then without warning the video shook and the stage came closer, into clearer focus, as though someone had physically moved the camera closer to it. Although the quality was still poor, I could now make out far more than before. What I could see sent a chill down my spine. The people on the stage were terrified. Some had injuries, others were just crying, but each wore an expression of fear and defeat on their faces. I could now clearly see what the large masked man had done to each of them when he moved onto the stage. Their hands were tied with thick chains, which then led behind them to the back of the stage where they were tied to an anchor point holding the people in place. A flurry of movement from the left of the screen caught my eye as a man seemed to dance into frame and the stage was illuminated by a large spotlight. He was a tall man in a fancy looking black suit wearing a bird mask. There was a pit in my stomach as I recognized him as the mascot on the website I'd signed up for this game on. His dapper appearance and jovial attitude seemed to contrast with the terrified expressions of the people behind him. Their eyes were fixed on him, petrified. He seemed to be waving something around in his hand as he danced across the stage, something small and silver glinting in the bright spotlight. With a sudden jolt of terror, I saw the barrel that it ended in and the unmistakable shape of a pistol in his right hand. Jovially dancing his way to the podium, the man ended his elaborate dance in a deep bow before straightening up and leaning into the microphone on the podium. Welcome one and all, welcome. Well, there sure are a lot of you here this evening. We're so glad you could join us, but we know what you paid for, so let's get this show on the road. He said in an almost sing-song voice, something in what he just said stuck with me. Paid for. I hadn't had to pay for anything. Had the other players? I was staring at the screen when it struck me. Was this a video or was this a stream? That number in the bottom corner, was that the amount of people paying to view it right now? He had said there were a lot of us this evening. I felt sick. That number was in the tens of thousands and there were only 50 of us in the game. I didn't have time to contemplate this further before the man started up again. So folks, the numbers are in, and here are today's eliminations, he said, whimsically gesturing behind him with the gun, the terrified people on the stage cowering as it swept across their heads. Hunters first, he said, before gracefully making his way to the left of the stage. There were three people there each of them staring at the masked man, terrified as he paced backwards and forwards in front of them, like a ringmaster before a lion. With a start, I recognized one of the three. It was the man who had crashed into my car earlier today. He had several large cuts across his face and patches of blood staining his clothing. He was also holding one arm which looked to be in a cast, as well as his right leg. He looked as though he was about to cry. If he'd gone to the hospital after chasing me across that road, then these people must have kidnapped him from there. As much as it pains me to admit, I did feel a sick sense of irony that he had been kidnapped by these people when he had effectively tried to do the same to me earlier today. These three have no points whatsoever, and we don't need any hunters who can't hunt so they're out of here, said the announcer, mimicking a baseball commentator. In a flash, he raised the gun and let off three quick shots. The hunters collapsed, clutching their stomachs, and the stage background behind them sprayed crimson with blood. 
The color drained from my face and the world seemed to fold in on itself. I struggled to hear the rest of what he said over the screams of the six hiders as he merrily danced his way over to them. I felt sick. What the hell was happening? I knew there were hardly any rules in the game, but nowhere mentioned being killed for failing. I wanted to cry those poor people. Then a terrifying thought struck me. If either of those two hunters had caught me, I'd be up there too, standing chained before that psychotic bird-masked man. The announcer's voice came through again, breaking the silence and snapping me back into reality. I didn't want to watch what happened next. I knew what he was going to do, but I couldn't command myself to look away. And these unlucky hiders managed to get caught. You know what that means, he said again in that sing-song voice before letting off several more shots, each bang followed by a chorus of screams from the hiders. Some tried to run as they watched their fellow contestants collapse, but the chains around their wrists held them in place. Within a few seconds, the stage was silent, each hider slumped over in a large pool of crimson red. After the final hider fell, the announcer turned back to face the camera. That's it for today's eliminations. Well done to the rest of you guys and gals. But what fun would the game be if we didn't mix things up? My heart sank. What did he mean by mix things up? The game was already dangerous enough as it was. A cold fear washed over me as I dreaded to think of what they would do next. To add just a bit more spice to this already stellar start to the game, we're reducing the size of the play area. Everybody get nice and cozy now but that should be no problem for you skilled players now, should it? Have fun and remember, don't get caught. His words seemed to darken as he said the last sentence. Then the feed cut abruptly and stopped, leaving only the black background on the screen reflecting my stunned face. I was numb. What the hell was this? They were, they killing people now? This was supposed to be a fun, scaled up version of a children's game. That's what the site had promised not some kind of sick snuff entertainment site for freaks on the dark web to get their kicks. Lifting a trembling finger, I tapped the close button that had appeared on the video player. It was slow to respond, but after a few seconds, I found myself on what I assumed was the site's homepage. It was minimalistic, just like the feed. A plain black site with several links to other videos. They all seemed to be named based on children's games like the names of the games on the site I'd been on when this all started. Each had a number next to them and an icon of a coin. It took me a few seconds to understand what I was seeing. With horror, the realization of what was going on struck me like a bolt of lightning. The organizers of the game were using us. That site must have been some kind of honey trap, trying to entice people into what they thought was a fun large-scale game. Then once we'd signed up and given our permissions, we'd discover that we were just participants in their sick site, helping them to make entertaining content for their deprived watchers on the dark web. The prize money, reducing people's suspicions, was the perfect way to get them to sign up, not realizing what was going on until it was too late. I felt sick. Bile rose in my throat, and my mind was reeling. I had to sit down. What the hell do I do now? How can I get out of this? A thousand possibilities raced through my mind, each of them shouting over each other in a maddening cacophony. Maybe if I just get out of the area of play, I could get away, run far enough that the organizers wouldn't be able to catch up with me. The fifth rule from the site echoed in my brain. Once you're in, you're in. No backing out until the game is complete. I had no idea how far these people would go in order to punish me if I broke the rule. But then again, I had no idea how long I'd be able to survive in this sinister competition. Another snagging thought reminded me that there was also no guarantee that they would let me live if I won anyway. As I sat there wallowing in despair and my churning thoughts, my phone gently buzzed. Picking it up, I noted that it was an email from that same address again. What now? What more could they possibly want from us now? I whispered, defeated. The subject of this mail was titled, New Play Area. When I shakily opened it, expecting the worst, 
I found that it contained only a single screenshot from Google Maps with a crude red circle drawn around it. Studying it, I determined that this must be the new area that the announcer in the video was talking about at the end. A sinking feeling spread through my stomach as I inspected it. It was a lot smaller than the city, only containing the city center and a few other areas outside. Did they seriously expect anyone on the Hiders team to have a chance? There was no way anyone would be able to hide for 13 days in that tiny area, not with the amount of us left. But then again I thought to myself with a shiver, they probably didn't care, they just wanted to make this show as entertaining as possible for their viewers, and we would be an afterthought at best. Reviewing it again, I noticed that the mall I was currently in was located just on the edge of this new area. Just a short walk away from the boundary, I was almost as far out as I could be. That's it, I thought to myself. I'm getting out of this. I'm not playing anymore. As quickly as I could, I rose to my feet, my left leg screaming as I put my weight on it, nearly giving way. I looked down at it and immediately wished I hadn't. My head began to spin and the acidic taste of vomit welled at the back of my throat. My leg looked awful. There was a river of thick ruby blood running down each side of it pooling in the cuff of my sock before leaking down over my now blood-stained shoes. The blood was streaming from about halfway up my calf. I could see the hole in my jeans, where the bullet had made its way back out into the world after tearing its way through the muscle and sinew that stood before it. I could clearly see the concrete behind me through the now gaping hole. Now that the adrenaline had worn off, it hurt like hell. I couldn't go to the hospital, I knew it wasn't safe there. That maniac driver had gone there and now look at what had happened to him. Plus, with the hunters now confined to a much smaller area, there was no guarantee that I would even make it there at all. The only thing I could think to do was to try and bandage my leg up as best I could and deal with it later, when it was safe. I looked around, scanning the courtyard for anything that I could use to bandage my bleeding limb. Nothing immediate came to view and I was about to give up and go and look for something in the mall when I remembered the dumpster. It was full of clothing. It was also in black bags, so although not sanitized, it's not like it would be disease-ridden either. I hobbled over there, stumbling a few times as my injured leg tried to buckle. I fell onto the side of the dumpster, letting it hold my weight as I fished around for the nearest bag, hoping it would have something suitable I could use. Grasping tightly to the black plastic, I yanked it out before tearing it open to reveal its contents. Several linen shirts sprawled out as the plastic gave way. Relief washed through me. This was just what I needed. Tearing off the sleeves of a couple of the shirts, I tied them tightly around the gaping hole in my leg, trying not to focus on the torn muscles within. Pain flared in me like a fire, spreading up my leg and into my very being as I tightened the makeshift bandages. Cold sweat broke out across my forehead and I began seeing stars in my vision. I was just about to pass out from the pain, but thankfully, it dissipated. Getting to my feet again, my legs still throbbed and burned, but it at least felt slightly more supported now, though I had no idea how I would be able to run again with it in this state. I slowly limped across the courtyard, the door back into the mall getting ever closer. Making my way through it, the memory of the screams of the workers from before jumped to the forefront of my mind. I couldn't go back that way. I couldn't bear to see what the aftermath of my decision to run through these tunnels looked like. I don't think I'd be able to live with myself. I slowly glanced around, noting another corridor leading off to the right. I had no idea where it went, but it was sure as hell better than going the way I'd come. I limped along through it for what felt like hours before finding a door that led back into the main mall plaza. All the while I felt weak and sick, my leg burning, and the events of that video feed reeling around in my head. The mall was almost deserted now, there were a few stragglers finishing up their shopping before the stores closed their shutters. Most paid me no mind as I limped past, although a few stared at me in horror as they noticed my bloody left leg. I ignored them when they tried to ask me what had happened or if I needed help. Even if they wanted to help, there was nothing they could do for me now. Making my way out of the mall, the cool evening air hit me. I began shakily heading in the direction of the new boundary, all the while checking over my shoulder for any trace of the hunters. 
I couldn't run anymore in this state, and it would be stupid to get caught now when I was so close to escape. My heart began pounding in my chest, reverberating in my eardrums, and I walked the quickly darkening streets towards the edge of the play area. I was relieved not to have seen anyone so far, but the overwhelming tension I felt was crushing. As I slowly approached where I thought the boundary was, I did my best to dart between the nearby houses, concealing myself as best as I was able to, then checking around for any particularly enterprising hunters who may be waiting near the edges to catch me. Much to my relief, there was no one, no hunters, no organizers, no one. I made it. Breathing a sigh of relief, I took a step over the boundary and began to move as quickly as my burning leg would allow. I had no idea where I was going, but I needed to move to get as far away as I could until this game was over and I could go about my normal life again. I'd made it maybe three steps when my phone buzzed again. That little sound, so innocuous, seemed to ring through my ears with a heavy weight. I wanted to ignore it, to check it when I was safe, but something clawed at the back of my mind like an itch. Slowing my pace to a gentle walk, I reached my phone out of my pocket. Unlocking it, the shattered screen revealed the new notification. It was a text message. The number was not any that I recognized, just a random string of digits. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my teeth were on edge. It had to be from the organizers. I shakily tapped on it, the message expanding on the screen. It contained only a picture and two words. They made me freeze in place and my blood run cold. It took all of my strength not to break down crying. The picture in the message was dark, but I could clearly make out its contents. It was a picture of a house. My house. I recognized it immediately, and through the living room window, I could clearly see the unmistakable faces of my wife and child going about their evening. The picture looked like it was taken from just across the street. There were twigs and leaves at the edge of the frame, and I realized with horror that whoever it was that sent the message was sitting in the bushes just opposite my house, watching my family. They thought I was away for two weeks on business. They had no idea of the danger they were in. I felt weak, the bile rising in my throat again. Then I read the text underneath the picture and all of my strength left me. I dropped to my knees, sending a lightning bolt of pain burning up through my injured leg. There were only two words, but they were enough to shatter my world. Turn back, turn. These people knew where I lived. They were outside my house, and who knows what they'd do to my wife if I stopped playing. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I burst into a fit of tears, pain racking my broken ribs with each heavy sob. I was trapped. If I carried on playing this monstrous game, I'd likely lose my life. But if I tried to escape, then these maniacs would kill my family and probably still come after me too. There was nothing I could do, and this was all my fault. If I'd not joined the stupid game, then none of this would have happened. I was stupid to think I could have snuck out of bounds. They must have been tracking my phone. That's why there was no one waiting on the border. They didn't need anyone to keep watch. They already knew. Willing myself back to my feet, I turned back around and limped across the border, defeated, slunking back to the area of play. The only thing I could think of was to go back to my original plan of going back to the cafe. That's where I am right now, writing this. I can't say exactly where the hunters are monitoring. All I know is I can't get caught. There's too much at stake now. I wish I'd never joined this stupid game. Don't be like me if you see something on the dark web that sounds too good to be true. It definitely is. I don't know when I'll be able to post again. If I'll be able to post again, but right now I just need to survive. God help me. That Christmas Eve, I was excited to visit my new boyfriend Jack's parents. I had grown attached to Jack in the few months we had been dating and his parents, whom I had met once before, seemed gentle, kind, somewhat sad from the tragedy of losing their other child, a daughter a few years ago, to cancer. But perhaps I only thought this because Jack had mentioned his deceased sister a few times in passing. 
Jack had bought me a new dress for Christmas. Odd, I thought, but then perhaps I had watched Vertigo too many times and saw too much about gender and feminism online. It was beautiful, with an unusual dark green and red pattern which perfectly brought out the highlights of my chestnut hair. Jack's eyes lit up when he saw me twirling around in it, and he said he couldn't wait for his parents to see me. We entered their suburban home, and Jack helped me take off my winter coat while his parents made polite noises at us, which were cut short when they laid eyes on me. His mother's eyes welled up, and clapping her hand to her mouth, she left the hallway. I looked up at Jack. He was smiling. Mom, he called. His father frowned, but then remembered his manners and turned to me. Come inside, my dear. You should have a drink now that you're here. Did Jack never tell you? His voice trailed off. I followed his dad into the brightly lit living room, and suddenly I understood. For hanging on the wall was a full-length photo portrait of a young woman with Jack's features and rich chestnut hair, wearing the same beautiful red and green dress I had on. I turned to Jack angrily. How could he play such a mean trick on us, on me, on his parents? But when I saw his face, my anger turned to fear at the fixed look on his face. He came up to me and took my hands, looking deeply in my eyes. Please, sweetheart, don't be mad. He beseeched. They're always so sad at Christmas, always going on and on about Lucy. She was their favorite, you know. I thought you might cheer them up. His grip tightened Ned and the feelings of fear and confusion deepened Ed. I looked at his parents helplessly. They were seated on the couch, his father's arms around his mother's slumping shoulders while she dabbed at her ease. They looked so frail and ill. What were they thinking? Please, darling, let's just have dinner. They prepared a real feast for us, all the things you like, just for a couple of hours, murmured Jack. Was it social conditioning? Was it survival? My skin crawling, I dumbly nodded. Jack turned to his parents. Mom, Dad, we're starving. Is dinner ready? He said brightly. Mom got up, visibly pulling herself together. We have nibbles in here. Where are your manners, John? Offer them drinks, she scolded her husband. Jack's dad turned to me. What would you like, my dear? Drinks in hand, the atmosphere relaxed, and Jack started chattering. I love the photos you put up, Mom. Where did you even find these? This is our last ski trip together, right? Lucy was such a champ. Do you remember when he turned to me mid-flow? Dad won medals in skiing, you know, state championships, and Lucy took right after him. His father beamed, and their last vestiges of courtesy towards me gave way to their obvious desire to talk about their daughter. They reminisced enthusiastically about their family vacations, gesturing to what seemed like the hundreds of photos, all in glinting silver and gilt frames on the walls. Of course I could never ski like her, I heard Jack say, and Lucy baked with Mom. Oh, Jack, are you still not over it? His mom responded almost playfully. My phone vibrated. Discreetly, I pulled it out, thanking God that Lucy had had the good sense to wear a dress with pockets, a single work from an unknown sender. Leave. Who is it, darling? called Jack, looking over his shoulder, interrupting himself in a deep analysis of whether he or Lucy were more popular in high school. I shook my head. It must be spam, I said lightly smiling at his mom. I looked at the photo over her head, and it was of Lucy, doing some kind of school presentation. She looked directly at me. I felt slightly dizzy. The wine, the PowerPoint slide in the photo shimmered, and the word was clear, leave. Lucy seemed to nod. The voices rose and swirled around me. I need to use the bathroom, I said. His mom showed me the guest bathroom, thankfully next to the front door. I went in, and as soon as she left, I slipped out and opened the door. Are you leaving us? Jack's father was at the other end of the hallway, looking straight at me. I stared back, opening and closing my mouth. Suddenly there was huge crash from inside the living room. Glimpsing through, I saw the full-length photo of Lucy in dress fall into the floor. Distracted, Jack's father turned and I heard the startled cries of Jack and his mom. I didn't wait any longer. Grabbing my coat, I fled into the night.